Welcome to the Generative Biology Revolution, a special edition podcast series produced by the Scientists Creative Services team. This series is brought to you by Amgen, a pioneer in the science of using living cells to make biologic medicines. They helped invent the processes and tools that built the global biotech industry and have since reached millions of patients suffering from serious illnesses around the world with their medicines. Generative biology is a revolutionary approach to drug discovery and development that leverages machine learning and AI to design novel protein therapeutics. It holds the potential to enhance the speed and efficiency of discovery. In this series, Ray Deshaies, Senior Vice President at Amgen, discusses how generative biology is transforming drug discovery to make it more predictable, shorten timelines, and increase success rates of bringing life-saving medicines to patients who need them most. Naturally occurring proteins have evolved over millions of years to perform specific functions based on their sequences and folded structures. As our understanding of protein science has advanced over the past 25 years, researchers have begun designing proteins from scratch to solve novel challenges that modern societies face. In this episode, I talk to David Baker, director of the Institute for Protein Design at the University of Washington in Seattle, and one of the creators of the Rosetta Fold Protein Structure Prediction Tool. We discuss how to design proteins with sequences and structures that impart novel functions and how these design proteins will revolutionize drug development. David, it's really fantastic to be here with you today to talk about the future of protein design. One thing that's quite different about your career arc from other people that I've met in your field is that you have diversity in your background. I think you majored in physics at Harvard when you were an undergrad. You came to Berkeley and you worked on cellular biochemistry. Then you went on to do a postdoc where you did more biochemistry. Now you've gone in this direction of combining different types of science to study how sequence yields structure and then how to predict what structure a protein would have by coming up with different sequences. How do you think that background has influenced your career? It's been really important for protein design. The, the computation is really just part of it. There are other very important aspects. Number one is critical experimental evaluation. It's very easy to design things on the computer that look like they should solve whatever problem you want them to solve. But it's, of course, entirely another thing to, to test them experimentally. Protein design isn't done in isolation. One has to think about the applications. And certainly having a good background in cell biology has helped me think about the areas in which to pursue. At least I have an idea of the right questions to ask. There's different labs that are in the protein design space, and people have their different algorithms and their different approaches that they take. What are currently, from your point of view, what are the major approaches that are currently being taken in the general area of protein design? There's been this general problem of, given a protein of interest and a particular site on that protein, design a small protein which binds very, very tightly to it. It's sort of like having a particular lock, design a key that fits in it. And this is an important problem biomedically because uh, having the proteins that bind very tightly together could be the basis of therapeutics, diagnostics, sensors, and so forth. The first approach is traditional physical model-based approach. The, the goal is to design an amino acid sequence that will fold up into a structure which fits against the target makes very shape complementary and chemically complementary interactions. The whole problem is framed in terms of energy because proteins fold to their lowest energy states. The designed amino acid sequence should have as its lowest energy state the designed monomeric structure. Then the system of the monomeric structure and the target should have as, as its lowest energy state that bound complex. In developing the Rosetta program, which we use for these calculations, we've sought to make those energy calculations as accurate as possible, describing hydrogen bonding accurately and so forth. The new approaches instead involve deep learning. It's now pattern recognition, the deep understanding of sequence structure relationships that's inherent in networks like AlphaFold and RosettaFold. And these methods are proving to be very powerful. David, 
You mentioned binders, proteins that bind to a pre-specified target. Are you able to design protein binders right now? What can you design in terms of protein functionalities? It's case dependent because there's some targets which are very difficult for us to design binders to. But we've had considerable success recently designing systems which self-assemble into, for example, completely de novo drug delivery vehicles or vaccine platforms, sensors which undergo conformational changes which can be read out by luciferase activity, proteins that bind to small molecules, and proteins that catalyze chemical reactions. So one of the exciting areas about protein design is the possibilities are really, really wide. And that's sort of exemplified by the very wide range of functions that proteins carry out in biology, which really illustrates how versatile proteins can be. What's still very hard for you to design? We have a protein surface, which is highly charged, very polar. It will interact strongly with water molecules, and it's hard for us to design binders which bind to those surfaces. For enzymes, chemical reaction, which there are multiple steps, where the enzyme has to sort of compromise between facilitating each of those steps are still very hard. My understanding is when you're designing a protein, you're trying to come up with a sequence that will adopt a particular fold. An enzyme induces catalysis by stabilizing the transition state of the reaction. So you can design your target fold to the transition state, for example. But we know in the course of catalysis that amino acid side chains, and sometimes even the backbone, have to move to go from a configuration that binds substrate to one that's in the transition state to one in which the product is formed and now gets released from the enzyme, and then cycle back to the state that could bind substrate. Is that something you can do in a deliberate way now to design not just a target fold, but a target fold that will go through this molecular choreography? One of the things that that makes enzyme design much harder than binder design, because in binder design, you need to design a protein whose lowest energy state is perfectly complementary to the target. But an enzyme has to first bind the substrate then it has to selectively stabilize the transition state. And this transition state can often only vary in subtle ways from the substrate. And then finally, it has to release the product. Protein has to be able to move to accommodate those different states, and it has to compromise between them. And those are things which we're not really very good at yet. So those are current challenges, how to model those dynamics. Another problem that we're working on now, which is related, is the design of molecular machines where it's important to couple chemical energy to mechanical work. And that involves similar trade-offs. Motion is really important. You've mentioned designing protein sensors. Say, something like an implanted glucose sensor that could solve the problem of monitoring blood glucose to enable automated release of insulin for people with diabetes. Right now, could you make an artificial device or an engineered cell that binds glucose in the body, senses the molecule, and activates the release of insulin on demand? Glucose is a very polar molecule that interacts very strongly with water. So the problem is not designing the sensor, it's designing the binder. For other types of compounds, like coronavirus, which are not as polar, we've been able to design molecular devices that have a closed state and an open state and a binding element module for the target is caged, then the thermodynamics of target binding cause this system to open, at which point it emits light in the case of a luciferase-based sensor. So if we can solve the binding problem, it's not hard for us to transition to a sensor. We focused a lot so far on protein function, but there's other aspects of a protein that end up being really important from the point of view of developing a therapeutic. Can you design the half-life of a protein? Can you design the biodistribution of a protein? Can you design a protein so that it's fully synthetic and non-human, but it's not immunogenic? 
Yeah, well, those are all very important properties, and you can incorporate all the properties you want in your design effort. For example, uh, we've been designing a new class of compounds which are smaller and made out of unnatural amino acids to get across biological membranes. So we can design classes of compounds now using computational methods whose properties we can control. One of the biggest question marks, though, is immunogenicity. There we can incorporate properties that are likely to reduce immunogenicity. We can make proteins that are very stable, very soluble, and relatively small in size, so they're unlikely to be presented efficiently on dendritic cells. We can't completely rule out the possibility of immune response, so design proteins will need to go through the same sort of thing for safety and immunogenicity that any new drug candidate would. David, you also just mentioned designing proteins that cross biological membranes, which isn't something that they can naturally do unassisted. Tell me, how does that work? There are peptides like cyclosporin, an 11 residue cyclic peptide that gets across membranes very effectively. There are a few examples of peptides like this in nature, which are thought to perhaps switch conformations to enable this traversal. And we can now robustly design whole class of those molecules. Do you see this driving towards a future where you could have orally bioavailable biologics? That would be a game changer, right? Because right now, biologics, you have to inject them either through subcutaneous or infusion into a vein. If you could cross membranes, you could formulate them in a way into a pill and then just ingest it. Do you see design going in that direction? There are two types of membrane permeability. There's passive permeability, where the biophysical properties of the protein make it permeable. That's going to be restricted to compounds which are quite small in size, like the cyclic peptide. There is facilitated transport that makes use of cellular uptake mechanisms, and the, the size uh, range is much larger. There also are things like diphtheria toxin, which have figured out how to get proteins across membranes. There are certainly opportunities for orally available biologics, but the approach I described earlier is really going to be limited to smaller compounds where you can basically engineer the outside in at least one state to be largely nonpolar. One of the real big stumbling blocks for biologic therapy has been the blood-brain barrier. Biologics, in terms of the best-selling drugs in the world, they've largely taken over that realm, in part because of their tremendous therapeutic efficacy coupled with their considerable safety advantages. But that has not happened in neuroscience, particularly diseases of the central nervous system. And now you're talking about getting design proteins across membranes or taken up into cells. Do you see a role for protein design in potentially cracking an intractable barrier? So we're working hard on blood-brain burial traversal, and uh, there we're focusing mainly on the receptor-mediated approach. So we have designed small proteins which bind to the transferrin receptor away from the transferrin binding site that are showing promise in shuttling compounds. And we're designing now a series of small proteins to other targets at the blood-brain barrier. Now, those would be more like shuttles. You would attach a cargo to them. The approach with cyclic peptides, passive diffusion approach, is very interesting. But the compound itself has to be the drug because if you start elaborating it by fusing on a large additional drug moiety, you're likely to impede passive permeability. So this is a, a, a sweet spot for protein design to help solve the blood-brain reversal problem, but there's still a lot of work to be done. One thing that I've been really interested in is in this area of targeted protein degradation by heterobifunctional molecules that Craig Cruz and I, when we came up with this, we called ours Protex. The way these works is they bind a ubiquitin ligase with one hand and they bind a target with another hand and so serve as a bridge to link a target to ubiquitin ligase. And then ubiquitin ligase puts ubiquitin on the target, target gets degraded. The ones that are most effective what you see is that when you bring the target and the ligase together, they actually fortuitously find some interaction surface such that you have a cooperative formation of a ternary complex between the three molecules, the ligase, the target, and the heterobifunctional compound. So let's say I have a target 
and I want to figure out which ubiquitin ligase might it interact with so that I can make a protac to join them together. Is that a problem that's addressable using this approach? It's really a fascinating protein design problem. You have three rigid bodies that are moving at the same time. That's what makes the design of molecules which induce these ternary complexes challenging. As far as taking advantage of the new ability to predict protein-protein complexes, these methods still rely to some extent on coevolutionary information. So they're taking advantage on how residues are co-faring at the interface, which means that they aren't going to be anywhere near as effective for complexes which don't actually assemble physiologically. We found that the methods are quite effective for design proteins, but they're binding to targets. We need a little bit more improvement in protein-protein docking or prediction methods to get to the point of designing complexes that are stabilized by a small molecule. It's somewhat harder than predicting the structures of naturally occurring complexes. We discussed the major types of design, and you brought out two different schools, the physics-based school that's focused on forces and the information-based approach that's driven by, say, artificial intelligence. As you're projecting to that future, which of those do you think is going to play the biggest role? There's going to be an integration between them. For challenges where it's entirely protein systems made out of 20 amino acids, I think the deep learning methods are very powerful. But as you start getting to small molecules, then physical models are going to be important. We also talked about dynamics and enzymes, and their physical models are going to be very important as well. What's your vision of where you see the field of protein design going in the next, say, 10 to 20 years? What's the boldest thing that you have in mind for this field achieving in that time frame? The things that we're doing now, I, I don't think I really could have even conceived of two or three years ago. And so projecting 10, 15 years out is hard. I'm optimistic that 10 to 15 years from now, medicine will really be transformed by protein design for the reason that you alluded to earlier, that you can really incorporate all of the properties that you want to in an ideal medicine in terms of functionality, side effects, biodistribution. And the more we understand, the more we can encode in the therapeutic or vaccine. Whereas approaches that don't involve design, there's always going to be a lack of control. For example, if you have to use a library or an animal to make an antibody, you're going to have a fundamental lack of control over what the actual properties are of that selected binding interface. I always hope that the most exciting applications will be things that I can't currently conceive of because new paths have been opening up at an astounding rate over the last several years. I think it's really what makes science exciting and fun. David, this has really just been fantastic. I just want to close by thanking you for taking the time today to come talk to us about protein design and where you see the field going. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you, Ray. Thank you for listening to The Generative Biology Revolution. Thanks again to David Baker, Director of the Institute for Protein Design. To dive further into this topic, please join Amgen scientists at the Generative Biology Q&A webinar discussion on July 20th, 2022. Register for the event at the link provided in the episode notes. Protein design and structure prediction are making big waves in the pharmaceutical industry. In the next episode of the Generative Biology Revolution, we'll talk with Susan Edivital, the Executive Director of Protein Engineering at Amgen, about the practical applications of protein design for drug development. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe to The Scientist Lab Talk wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast contains forward-looking statements that are based on the current expectations and beliefs of Amgen, all statements other than statements of historical fact are statements that could be deemed forward-looking statements, including any statements around the potential science and innovation of genetics and drug discovery. Forward-looking statements involve significant risks and uncertainties, including those described in the Securities and Exchange Commission reports filed by Amgen, including our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and any subsequent periodic reports on Form 10-Q and current reports on Form 8-K. Unless otherwise noted, Amgen is providing this information as of the date of this podcast and does not undertake any obligation to update any forward-looking statements contained in this podcast as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. No forward-looking statement can be guaranteed, and actual results may differ materially from those we project.